I was raised in a domestically violent household. I remember looking up at my mother while her bruised, fat, swollen lip hung over me, or seeing her punched in the eye so hard that a tear of blood escaped down her cheek. But I also experienced the violence. I can still feel my hair being ripped from my scalp, or being choked so violently that my feet dangled off the ground, or being kicked in the stomach with steel-toed boots so hard that it felt like his foot was going to go through my spine. At age 15, after I had already gone to the police and told them about my experiences and they did nothing, I knew I needed to get out of there. So I dropped out of school, I moved states, I found a job and moved in with my first boyfriend. Unfortunately, he became another abuser. He violently raped and beat me regularly. And he would steal my paycheck, so he made me feel like I was economically dependent on him, even though we were equal earners. After about a year, the violence was escalating so much that I felt like he was going to murder me. So I left. I moved states again. I found two new jobs. And I started homeschooling myself to earn my high school diploma. Once I did, I entered community college, but I was terrified. I remember looking around at everybody, and I felt so different. I had endured trauma almost every single day of my life up until that point, and it was seeping out of me in the form of panic attacks. I had post-traumatic stress disorder. And I knew I needed to find a way to cope with my experiences, so I started writing about them in my academic classrooms and talking about them in our classroom discussions. And I had wonderful teachers that enabled me to see my experiences as not just an individual issue, but as part of larger systematic issues. I was one among many in my community college, in my community, in the United States and in the world that experienced gender-based violence. With my teacher support, I earned A's in almost all of my classes. And I graduated with honors from community college and then highest honors from UC Berkeley. And then I earned a master's degree from an Ivy League. Now, I'm pursuing my second master's degree and a PhD at The Ohio State University. Now, throughout my studies, I've been aware of the Title IX requirement that is a wonderful piece of legislation that mandates that no person be discriminated against on the basis of sex, and this has really worked to improve gender equality. What I'm concerned about is the mandatory reporting requirement. I know now about the requirement, and I'm afraid to talk about my experiences in my classrooms because I know that my teachers are required to report me, and I don't consent to that. And that should be my choice. But I also teach undergraduate students, and I alert that them that I am a mandatory reporter, and I know I'm likely, likely silencing many of my students who may have felt comfortable talking about their experiences previously. So it's really important to look at mandatory reporting in relation to the statistics. About three women a day are murdered by an intimate partner in the United States. Every, 24, or every minute, 24 people become victims of rape, physical violence, or stalking by an intimate partner. But only about 34% seek medical treatment for an injury caused by an intimate partner, demonstrating that these people generally don't want others to know about what they're experiencing and don't want to be reported. Out of every thousand rapes, only 310 are reported, while only 57 lead to arrest and only six to incarceration, meaning 994 out of every thousand alleged rapes, perpetrators do not see jail time for the crime. And one in five women who are college students will experience rape or attempted rape while a college student, but only 5% are reported. 
So I can look in my classroom and even in this room today and know that there are people who are probably survivors of rape and other forms of gender-based violence. But what's important to note is that people who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender are even higher risk of intimate partner violence or rape. But heterosexual men can also be victims of these crimes too. These are crimes that impact everyone, yet in different ways. So knowing these very high rates of gender-based violence, but the very low rates of survivors consenting to reporting these violences, this clearly conflicts with the mandatory reporting requirement. And we have to ask, why is this? Universities are increasingly built on business models. They're becoming less student-centered and more centered on mitigating risk and producing profit. But in this process, mandatory reporting can actually re-victimize survivors. So if somebody has disclosed an experience of gender-based violence to a teacher or an employee of an institution and they're reported, they may feel like their consent and their trust has been violated when they made themselves so vulnerable already. And in many cases, survivors are still in intimate relationships with their abuser. And the violence may escalate if the abuser learns of the investigation process, potentially by monitoring an email account or a cell phone account of the survivor. And also, the survivor may take the side of the perpetrator because they may feel like they love them, much like I felt like I loved my abuser. So it's really important to question with the high rates of gender-based violence, but the low rates of, of people reporting it, why this is in place. And it really can subject survivors to victim blaming, to not being believed like we've seen so many times before, and to being forced to relive their trauma by being asked about it by strangers that they did not initially consent to talking about it to. So the big question is, what are we gonna do about it? Because I can tell you from my perspective, I probably wouldn't be here advocating for survivors of gender-based violence at the educational level that I am had I been reported. So what is important is we need to abolish mandatory reporting and that whatever takes its place is centered on the needs of survivors. We need to make sure that as universities, its employees, its teachers, we're not violating the consent of survivors like the perpetrators already have done. But we need to make sure we're getting survivors the resources that they need. So we should mandatorily and reoccurringly train teachers on how to talk to survivors of gender-based violence and provide them resources they need. And we can also put posters throughout campus with all the community and campus resources that survivors can choose to use at a time that's right for them, in a way that's right for them, and which one is right for them, if any. But what's really important is that we also focus on preventative measures. We need to teach people not to rape not to sexually assault, not to stalk, not to beat, not to commit any form of gender-based violence. And this needs to happen from very young ages all the way through their entire lives. And this training needs to be focused on sex positivity, on eradicating harmful gender stereotypes, and on the awareness that people can experience intersecting forms of violence at the same time be it systematic racism, systematic sexism, systematic homophobia, and so on. And that may make them more vulnerable to gender-based violence and not being able to seek adequate remedies to cope with what they have gone through. So I can tell you that while I am a statistic, I am also an individual that matters. And so do all other survivors of gender-based violence. So whatever replaces mandatory reporting, it's important that it is centered on us and our needs. Thank you.